So we're going to get started. Bronwyn, go ahead and share your screen for us so that we know it still works. <laughs> and just to be level setting. If sure. You, did, did you scare me? Yeah. Just, nope, nope, that's fine. Okay. Uh, for expectation's sake, Bronwyn is at the bottom of a canyon. Not like she was she's abandoned. Like really stuck there, right? It's by her her choice. Yes. She's she wasn't not being held. Out there. It's not a second location. Her, her house is... <laughs> That's where the not, uh, that's the secret problem there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and she's coming to us live from Starlink. Yes. And so Starlink is this thing <laughs> that I get to see the satellites pass by every once in a while. And uh, so sometimes the Starlink is moving. And so for a few seconds, she's gone. So for <laughs> expectation's sake, uh, every once in a while, Bronwyn will be gone. We know she'll be gone, and then she'll be back. If it's too long, we'll pop back in and be like, yeah, we'll be like oh, hey, hey, everybody. It, it seldom lasts as long as 30 seconds. And believe me, compared to who I had before, this is so much better That's because better. I can actually stream. Mm -hmm. The data dropouts are an annoying factor, but it's it's just bear with. We'll, we'll get through this together. Hello, welcome. And uh, I, I want to, before I, I say anything in the presentation proper, I, I kind of want to throw a, a disclaimer. Yes, I work for BHIS. Yes, uh, I am the editor on staff who's been there the longest. Everybody except for John's sister, Melissa. But some of the opinions that I'm going to express <laughs> are entirely my own. And uh, so I, I just want to get that out of the way before I do anything else. So let's talk about some things not to do in your pen test report. Hacking is fun, but at the end of the day, the report is the product. A good report is going to tell a story. It's going to tell what was found during the engagement, going to tell how it was found. Most of all, it's going to tell how what was found can be fixed. And this is where I'm going to go on a limb here. I believe that a bad report can do harm. The best case scenario, if you write a bad report, is that the report will be ignored. Your customer will make no changes to their infrastructure. Attitudes won't change. It'll be business as usual until they get hacked. And then they're going to come after you, but that's a whole other story. The worst case scenario is not as appealing. A bad report will tarnish your credibility as a penetration tester. If you're a contractor working for another company, the report will tarnish that company's reputation. And the very worst case scenario is that if your report is bad enough, it will sour the customer to the value of security in general. Oh, I got a penetration test done and the report just sucked. These people don't know what they're talking about. We don't want to go there. That's, that's the end scenario we want to avoid at all costs. And it's not that hard to do. And this is, again, where I'm going out on a lid. I believe that an adequate hacker who writes well is more useful to a customer than a elite hacker who writes poorly. And this is something especially for people who are just coming into the, into the business, who are coming into the industry. I'm not good enough to be a penetration tester. You know what? If you can communicate clearly and... You can you can be an adequate or even a mediocre hacker, but if you can run scans, if you can analyze what's going on and you can communicate what you find, then you have value. You have a place here. The super duper hacker skills can be learned and they're not the only thing that can be learned. Now, why do I say all this? I have decades of experience in communication. A gajillion years ago, I was planetarium lecturer for the Griffith Observatory here in Los Angeles. I'm a published writer. I'm, uh, I have years of technical training experience. I did web development and UI UX design. All of these things have to do with communicating with people. 
I've also been a technical editor for BHIS since 2018. And through that involvement with BHIS, I read and edit in excess of 200 pen test reports per year. So if there's a sin that can be committed in a pen test report, I've seen it. Guaranteed. When it comes to penetration test reports, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is a lot of reports are being written, a lot of bad reports. And one of the things that we've seen, especially since the onset of the pandemic, is vulnerability scans being sold as pen test reports. And so many of them have been pushed out that way, marketed that way, that now what we're seeing is small boutique inf information security companies are going under. And if you've been following any of the webcasts, if you're paying attention to John Strand's various rants, this is something that he's been going off about repeatedly in the past couple of months. And the, the thing about John, when he brings something up over and over again, it's, it's something that he's gnawing on. And it's something that worries him. Now, the good news, writing good reports is a skill that can be learned. You learned how to hack. You learned how to use Nmap and Burp Sweep and all that stuff. You know what? Hack your writing. I mean it. It's, it this is a skill like anything else. Another thing about learning to write well is that writing and communication skills are valuable. They're transferable. You will get collateral benefits from learning how to communicate better far beyond anything that you can imagine. So really, really make an investment in yourself by learning how to write and how to communicate as clearly as possible. And the other thing is that a good pen test report is what provides value to your customer. You Did I get lost a little bit? All right. You're back. All right. So a good pen test report is what provides value to your customer. The report is the product. It is the deliverable. And so this is where you want that report to be as good as possible. So let's talk about the seven deadly sins of report writing. Now, there are way more ways, many more ways that a report can go sideways. However, I focused on these. Bad writing, duh. Condescending tone, you don't want to go there. Bad screenshots, so common. Inconsistent formatting, yo, eek. Randomized lists, very big peeve. Irrelevant guidance, obnoxious, and um, information from another customer. We'll talk in detail about that. So let's start off with the uh, Cantosaurus in the room. Bad writing. Don't do it. I mean, bad writing can be anything from typos to misspellings. Poor grammar. One of the biggest things that I see is um, improper uses of scene, um, mixed tenses. I mean, if you're right, if you're supposed to be writing in the past tense, use it consistently, consistently within a sentence, please. You also want to avoid using too much jargon. This is a business document. You're not writing a tweet. You want it to be professional. And you also want to avoid having your sentences be too convoluted. I've, I've seen it, uh, I don't know how many times, and I've, I've been in IT for longer than I like to admit to anymore. If I go through a sentence describing what was done and I get to the end of the sentence and I have no idea what happened, it's going to be even worse for most non-technical, non-hacker-oriented people. So you want to avoid making things too convoluted. Break it out into smaller sentences. There's nothing wrong with that. 
And the other thing is clear narrative. Narrative is a, a term that you will hear writers discuss a lot. And, and I'll get into a little bit more in, in just a moment. So let's talk about what good rep report writing entails. A good report tells a story. That's the narrative part. It's going to be easy to follow. But also, this is where your report is the vehicle that you use to advocate for behavioral changes. And that means you have to explain why the things that you find matter. And that means it also has to be accessible to the reader. So one of the things that I encountered when I was at Griffith Observatory is that Someone would come up to me and they want would want to have me explain to them how it is that a star like our sun burns continually. And there's a process called um, uh, hydrostatic equilibrium. I'm not going to go into the formula or anything, but the concept behind how a star burns is always going to be the same. Now, how I explain it to a six-year-old child will be different from how I explain it to a 30-year-old construction worker and will be radically different from how I discuss it with a genuine rocket scientist from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The content itself does not change, only the delivery. Now, I, I see a couple of questions, active or passive voice for the narrative. Part of that is going to depend on your target audience. Uh, and it's it's actually something that writers and editors argue about a lot. <laughs> so I my bottom line is, is it effectively communicating what it is you want to get through to the reader? And um, there's another question, good sites to look at for learning to write better. We'll touch on those a little bit later on. Ways to improve your writing skills. This should answer some uh, questions here. Take writing classes. Yeah, I know. You don't want to take writing class. Well, you really are better off to do it. I don't care if you learn academic writing, technical writing, or journalism. There are There's a, a formula or a series of formulae on how to write for news radio and learning how to distill out concepts so that you're communicating them clearly. This is going to benefit you so much. Consider joining Toastmasters. You're sitting going, but Toastmasters is about public speaking. Exactly. If you can speak to something clearly, then that will improve your ability to write about it. And the other advantage about Toastmasters is when you give a talk through Toastmasters, you get immediate feedback. And, and the people in, in Toastmasters are there to help each other. So consider something like that. Or set yourself up to give a, a talk, a webinar, start doing a blog. Any of these things, it's a skill. The more you do it, the better you're going to be. Writing aids. Now, a word of caution, some writing aids, Grammarly in particular, has security issues. So you want to read the fine print and see how much access they're gaining. I've heard John Strand talk specifically about no red ink. And, and the flip side of it, though, I've also heard, seen for myself that um, Grammarly can help with your writing skills. Um, I have a very good friend. He's in college. He's a returning student. And he's using Grammarly, and it is helping him improve his writing. If you're writing in a uh, language that is not your native language, Consider using Duolingo, Babbel, or something else to improve your language skills. Let's see. To the next 
sin. This is one that I don't see a lot of, thank goodness. But it's important enough that I wanted to get it into the top seven sins for report writing. And that's condescending tone. Don't brag in your report. The focus of your report should be about what was found, not who found it. If you're bragging about how badly you pwned the company or organization or person in your report, that's just petty. No one cares how elite you are. And the more brazenly you shame the customer client, you want to be supportive. You want to be, and my internet connection has just gotten unstable. I got a little alert that I was unstable there. Oh, you're good. <laughs> okay. Uh, unstable, sure, but you're good. Okay. So the more brave you are, the more sending you are, the less like a customer is going to become a client. A customer is a one-off. Fire and forget, they may never see you again. But a client is someone who sees value in what you're doing, in what you've provided, in the questions that you've been able to answer. And so the way that you provide more value is you keep it professional and keep it objective. Now, your report, once it leaves your hands, it's in the wild. You have no idea who's going to read this report or for how many years it's going to float around. It may be read by executives, managers, other consultants. So you want to avoid emotionally loaded terms. So it was drastic, awful, bad. I, I've had testers, especially when a... Um, when a, a, a test went kind of sideways or the customer did something that was annoying to the tester, I've had to rewrite entire paragraphs or sections because no matter how hard the, the tester tried, the fact that they were angry came through in their writing. And it's a subtle thing, but you want to be very cautious about it. Academic writing styles are excellent examples. If you're not familiar with the OWL, O-W-L, Online Writing Lab through Purdue, become familiar with it. I'm not saying that you need to use the APA or the MLA or any of that, but um, academic writing is professional. And it's also a more formal tone. And and. The, the formal tone is something where it's about balance. You want to be formal and professional, but you don't want to be stilted. You're not Jeeves. You're not, you know, going around and, and bowing to people and, and using uh, large polysyllables and, and things. No, don't go there. But it needs to be professional. Another thing that you should do is specify and quantify whenever possible. Objectivity is your friend. It also enhances your credibility. So an example of this would be, and I see this a lot, uh, many systems were lacking patches or there were several uh, servers that were using old or outdated versions of TLS, SSL, okay? Many, several, those are imprecise. They are relative. The tester scraped LinkedIn and other online resources and collected 3,200 user names and email addresses. Those were then used in a password spray and 1,600 accounts were found to be using easily guessable passwords. Numbers, specifics, those are objective. Objectivity is your friend. You also want to focus on what was found, not on who found it. And, and this is something that I see a lot, is that you know, BHIS found blah, blah, blah. You know what? I don't care who found it. The finding isn't who found what. The finding is 
26 servers were displaying default web content to the open internet. That is a finding, not VHIS found, blah, blah, blah. Not the tester found, blah, blah, blah. X number of systems had this issue. And one of the things that we do at VHIS and that I encourage you to do in your pen test reports is to use the past tense when describing findings. The reason I say that is because your, um, your pen test is a snapshot in time. For all you know, as soon as the engagement's over, boom, they're going to change their entire code base. They're going to have massive infrastructure changes. And what you observed may no longer be accurate, valid, or factual. So past tense is a good way to avoid that particular issue. Um, regarding using Grammarly on assessment of points, to, to backtrack a little bit, one of the things about some tools, and Grammarly is one example, is that it's going to read the entire document. And you never, ever, ever want to lose perspective on the fact that the information you have about the customer's infrastructure is privileged information. That's why we have NDAs. We'll get into that a little bit more later in the, the um, presentation. Again, ways to improve your writing skills. Read your report out loud. It sounds weird, but it works. I know, I do it all the time. One of the reasons why reading your report out loud is useful is because it activates different parts of your brain. When you're doing the writing, you're using certain parts of your brain, but when you say it out loud, you're using other parts of your brain. And when you actually read it out loud, you are going to find the rough spots. You're going to find the sentences that don't make any sense because when you're speaking it aloud, you're also hearing it. And you're gonna go, what the heck was that? I have no idea what I just said. And then you go back and you fix it. Simple, easy, portable, free. Another thing is you want to imagine how different people are going to react. And you know, is a CEO going to react to what you've written the same way that a middle manager will? You want to try to match the language you're using to the target audience. And this is one reason why not just through BHIS, but many pen test reports that I see will... Um, use um, different sections. So you'll have an executive summary, you'll have uh, another section where the findings are described, and then you'll have a methodology. I hold that each one of those sections has a very different target audience. Your executive summary is for executives. They want to know the bottom line. They want to know the broad strokes. They want to know how much this is going to cost and how severe it is in the simplest terms possible. Your, your middle managers, they're going to want to know um, in more granularity what it is that they need to do to uh, solve the problem, to make things better. And then you're gonna have the geek squad. You're gonna have the engineers, you're gonna have the coders, you're gonna have other people, and they're gonna wanna know the nitty gritty details. And those are very radically different audiences. And the tone and language used to describe what's going on needs to be set different for each of those audiences. Like I said, if I'm explaining something to a six-year-old versus a 30-year-old, versus a rocket scientist. I need to match my language to their needs because as a communicator, that's my responsibility is to match their language. 